So hello, everybody. Today we have with us Kyle Trigger Coronas, who um, runs SavingCountryMusic.com and occupies a very interesting uh, position in a very interesting space. And that's kind of as an influencer, an arbiter of taste, and an advocate for um, country music, which is a American art form, uh, a very important one, a quickly evolving one. That's something I think we'll probably get into. But before we do, I want to ask you, Kyle, why Trigger? Where did that come from? Where did the name come <laughs> from? Um, tell us a little bit about it. Well, it's. Uh, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Long story short, it's, uh, it's, it's a nickname that was bequeathed to me, uh, like all proper nicknames. I didn't create it for myself, but uh, it started actually when I was a kid. I was, uh, me and my buddies were kind of all into uh, shooting each other with paintball guns, and it just sort of evolved from whatever uh, uh, sort of ruffian uh, young punks shooting paintball guns at, at each other and our friends and our uh, adversaries, and I just got the name The Trigger Man, and uh, so that sort of became a a handle. And then uh, later it kind of became, uh, I don't know if you would a CB is or a citizen band radio. We were kind of big back, mm -hmm. you know, in the eighties and nineties and stuff. Yep. And so all of our friends had that. So that just became sort of my, my handle, the trigger man. And then um, as time evolved and like, you know, there were all these like mass shootings and stuff. I just sort of shortened it to trigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, that also happens to be the name of, um, Willie Nelson's guitar and Gene Autry's horse. So it kind of works <laughs> for the country music realm, you know, it's and uh, now it's even been shorter. Most people just call me Trig. So right. it's kind of, it's short for the trigger man, but, but. Cool. So, you know, on that note, where, where was it that you were growing up and you know, was that a part of your connection to country music or was that something that came later? Uh, definitely it was. And actually the nickname kind of falls into that because I grew up in this uh, southern part of Dallas, Texas, um, called Oak Cliff, though specifically I was a little bit farther south of that in a little um, suburb called Duncanville. And it was a really interesting place to grow up in because it really was sort of where the country met um, sort of the inner city. Uh, mm -hmm. Long story short, in that part of, of in the 80s um, in Dallas, um, you know, my specific little area was was officially a suburb, but just north of there, uh, Dallas was in a huge sort of crime wave. And so there were a lot of inner city families, working class, uh, especially black families moving into that area. And they were sort of clashing with sort of Redneckville that was original to that area. And so I kind of grew up sort of in the, uh, a culture war, a race war, if you will. And it was, it was kind of interesting, you know, but I got to experience a lot of different cultures, including obviously country, uh, country music and, and sort of rural culture, as well as a lot of inner city culture that was sort of moving into that area. Um, so, you know, when I was growing up, um, I didn't, I, I, as, aside from Willie Nelson, I honestly didn't listen to a lot of country music because the country music on the radio at that time, I just didn't find appeal. And it was like Garth Brooks and mm -hmm. Alan Jackson, what they call these days, they call it the class of 89. It was really the sort of commercial explosion of country music. Mm -hmm. And it just was kind of cool. It, it was popular music, country music that I didn't really find that much appeal in. Now, these days, um, time has been kind to that music, basically, because a lot of today's country music just is so pop and so commercial right. that there's a lot of nostalgia that is, has uh, made that music more appealing than the music of today to a lot of consumers, right. even younger consumers. And so, um, you know, at that time, I, the country music I was listening to was sort of classic, you know, classic Willie Nelson mm -hmm. uh, and those kinds of artists, but it really wasn't until um, sort of my late 20s that I really reconnected with country music uh, through artists like Hank Williams III and BR549, mm. who were hearkening back to the original um, sort of soul and sounds of uh, authentic country music. 
And that's why I was like, wow, this is the music I've been looking for my whole life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's where I reconnected with it. But of course, this music wasn't being played on the radio, you didn't see it on award shows, it wasn't part of the mainstream narrative. And so that's where I sort of got excited about, hey, someone needs to be covering this music. It's, it's amazing. And mm -hmm. if, if people know that it's out there, uh, then there will be more fans of it and then it'll be supported and can sustain. Yeah, it, it, it's really true. And I see this sort of as an outsider to country, but I remember I discovered through Johnny Cash, um, I discovered that that more original, more pure kind of country, the Hank sure. Williams. Um, I remember an album I had, I think it was like Hank Williams with Elvis and some, some, something along those lines, something that was like really distilled down to the basics. And it's a completely different sound than the kind of uh, pickup truck and shotgun country music that I grew up with in the nineties, the, you know, the Garth Brooks and like these kind of anthems that were a, a little bit overly sentimental and nostalgic. And it felt a little bit like a, a little bit of, you know, chintzy, a little too much tinsel in it. Yes. But, um, but, you know, going back to your, your growing up in Dallas um, and, you know, obviously the, the role that Texas plays today in the culture is a really interesting one because we're sort of returning to this idea of Texas as, uh, as a heartland where it had been on a cultural fringe for so long in America. And now the country is turning its attention back to Texas in such an interesting way and possibly to country as well, to country music. But I think, you know, what you're saying, what you're pointing to is that might not necessarily be a great effect because what we have is the American pop culture machine just cannibalizing this art form. So, you know, I might be wrong about that. That's obviously your area of expertise, but can you talk a little bit about that, that phenomenon and why we do need to be saving country music? Sure. Well, first off, I mean, when it comes to Texas specifically, Texas is an extremely diverse place. Um, and that doesn't always, you know, when, when it comes out, uh, you know, on a national landscape or an international landscape, that often gets distilled down pretty significantly, whether it's, you know, the new abortion law that's causing a lot of um, controversy right now, or whether it comes to country music. And, um, you know, luckily for me, um, right, you know, when I was very young, in my late teens and early 20s, I immediately left Texas, and I went traveling around the country. And that allowed me to see Texas from the outside looking in. And mm. it was funny, because, you know, whenever I went other places, um, I just traveled around, I was working, I was working construction jobs, and um, I would go around and, you know, when, as, as soon as people heard you were from Texas, they were like, Texas, you know, <laughs> screw Texas or whatever, you know, it, it just became like a narrative about who you yeah. were. Uh, it was so uh, integral with your identity. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it was very healthy for me because I was able to see, perceive Texas, how other people perceive Texans, not just as a native Texan. And so, you know, there's a lot of sort of misconceptions and stereotypes about Texas. And you're totally right. That gets ingrained in a lot of ways into country music. And, um, but, but what's interesting about Texas country, there, there is like, if one of the subgenres of country music, the modern subgenres, I mean, you have like bluegrass, you have other sort of, you know, like bro country, you go sort of mm -hmm. break it all down, but there is a very distinct a scene of music that's Texas country or Texas music. And it's very, it's, it's more singer songwriter based. It's mm -hmm. more heady. It's more involved. Um, you know, it, 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 it is grown out of the traditions of great songwriters like Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt, who were more progressive um, in their era as country music contributors. You know, they were songwriters first and then it broke down to like genres. And the only reason that they were considered in the country genre is because country entertainers were the ones who were recording their songs. But these people saw themselves as poet laureates. They saw themselves as uh, songwriters first, as, uh, you know, artisans of words. And that tradition is still very much alive here in Texas and in, in Texas country music. So, um, 
you know, that's sort of the contri contribution that Texas has. And, and more traditionally, it's Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings, who were the outlaws, who back in the 70s revolutionized country music. So before the outlaw movement, country music was very much centered in Nashville, Tennessee, on this location called Music Row. And Music Row is uh, 16th Avenue in Nashville, where basically every single part of the Nashville, in, of the mu country music industry is based. And it's where all the labels are, where all the managers are, where all the booking agents are, where all the song publishers are, where all the um, everything is, the studios are. And so everything was centralized on this one campus in, uh, in Nashville. And since none of the people that were located on that campus actually were the, the ultimate, they didn't own the music. The, the music was actually, it was like a mid-level command bureaucracy in Nashville, where the labels were actually owned and operated by big corporations on the two coasts in New York mm. or in Los Angeles. So here was Nashville and, you know, sort of in the in the south of the United States. And so they had these strict like budgetary restrictions they had to fall fall uh, under or in and like they had to everything had to be more of like a conveyor belt system because um, they had to like show profit and loss or they wouldn't, you know, the, their their commanders, you know, their the CEOs on the two coasts would get on, you know, would get on the label managers in Nashville. So what ended up happening is Nashville became this conveyor belt where you had producers like Chet Atkins. They would choose, you'd have an entertainer, let's say it was Willie Nelson or Waylon Jennings. They didn't get to choose what songs they would record. It would be Chet Atkins who would choose what songs they would record. The, uh, the players who would play on these songs, the instrumentalists, and it would all just be sort of this automated uh, industrial system of music making. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, Willie and Waylon were looking at rock artists and pop artists who got to write their own songs and play with their own players and choose what, you know, the, the creative direction of their music. Mm. So in the mid seventies, they chose to rebel. Like they rebelled against this music row system mm -hmm. and they were called the outlaws for it. That's why. And it, and it turned out to be the most commercially successful movement in country music up to that point. They released an, a, an album called The Outlaws. It mm -hmm. was a compilation. It was like previously, mostly previously released material. And it became the first platinum selling, selling album in country music history. So long story short, I was reading up about this, all this history. I wanted to write a book on outlaw country. And meanwhile, I was seeing there was a another artist called, uh, named Hank Williams III, who was the son of Hank Williams Jr., grandson of Hank Williams. And I was reading up about how he was having these same exact problems in the mid 2000s. And I was like, wait a second, this is 30 years later, and we're still fighting the same fights in country music. It's the same thing where you have big producers and big label owners decreeing from on high how artists should create their music. And so it seemed like this was a like a battle of evermore, an eternal struggle in country music, where it was like the big business interest was coming in and trying to make stuff more automated, more pop. And then you had country artists fighting against that system, trying to, you know, for their creative freedom. And so that's where saving country music sprang from, was this idea that this is an ongoing thing. It's an eternal battle in country music where you have authentic artists from the country or from anywhere. Uh, Europe, you know, there's, there's, there's country artists from all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, these are authentic creators um, trying to express themselves within the commercial confines of this corporate structure mm -hmm. and like coming in to advocate for those artists and their creativity. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot there um, that I'd love to talk about because it's such a universal story of the battle between 
authentic art and, and creation and people are trying to do what they're trying to do for the right reasons and the corporate interest on the other side where it's just like how do we make this into a factory how do we make it into a machine and it even you know there's some notes uh, there from uh, the story of hip hop, where hip hop even sounds like around the same time, like the late 90s and early 2000s, where this really authentic, on the ground, grassroots musical movement starts hitting up against the corporate machine. And it's just a recipe for disaster, I think, on both the commercial and an artistic front. Um, and it also makes me think about uh, that great movie by the Coen brothers, Inside Lewin Davis, where you see this artist struggling to to exist as an artist in a world where he's being thrown into these rooms to play what pop songs that are supposed to make a lot of money and some of them actually do but it it sort of kills him um it kills his soul so you know that seems to be this this trend seems to be almost in hyperdrive today because of the ubiquity of mass media. I mean, we have screens in every corner of our lives and where there is a screen, there is a mass media company, corporation pushing something because they're advertising something else. So, you know, when we look at someone who is really almost from my point of view, emblematic of this whole thing today, who is Taylor Swift, who started out as this country figure. I mean, I remember when she came out and she had that whole big flap with Kanye West at, at the Grammys and like, she was a country music singer in everybody's eyes. And then suddenly she wasn't, then she was a pop singer. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't know where, I know Lil Nas, who is sort of a rapper in the country space, um, I'm sure it falls somewhere on this spectrum as well, but it does seem like this is all accelerating in one sense, but in another sense, I also imagine that with so much independent media and with artists being able to get out to their audiences without a label and without a promoter or a manager or a big company behind them, that there's also a counter trend as well. Do you find that to be the case? Absolutely, no doubt. I mean, you're a hundred percent correct. I mean, so first off, I would say, you know, when, it, when you have a site called Saving Country Music, people sort of draw certain conclusions on that that aren't always true. I mean, like, there is definitely the need to do something exactly like what I'm doing, but in the hip hop realm, you mm -hmm. know, and in the rock realm, and even in realms like food and, uh, you know, uh, products of, of different sorts. Like, there's no doubt that um, we're all kind of uh, brothers and sisters in arms in this, in this sort of pushing back against uh, you know, sort of overreaching corporate interests, and not that all corporations are evil or anything like that, but, you know, that just sort of the, the commercialization of, of life and, and looking always at bottom line as opposed to uh, what's best and what's more sustainable um, and what makes uh, life more enjoyable. So, you know, there's, there's definitely like, um, you know, I think hip hop music needs, needs saving too. You know, I think, I think all of it does. And, um, specifically, when you're talking about um, the, uh, like, as far as like Taylor Swift and, and Little Nas X and like how, how the media is portraying that, you know, there's, uh, country music is in a very interesting space because right now it's like really hip to sort of use country music as a cultural sounding board. Mm. And um because generally speaking and traditionally, it is a, a predominantly white and predominantly conservative art form. And that's most certainly true. Like that, that stereotype is generally true, but it's also always pushed the boundaries. Like country music has always been very blue collar. It's been very, um, you know, like advocating for, uh, you know, sort of overlooked rural agrarian people and their rights um, and also blue collar factory workers. A lot of the songs you think about some of the classic Merle Haggard songs are about this very thing. Um, you know, and it also has a lot of, um, you know, traditions in, in African American culture that unfortunately have not been emphasized over the years enough. Um, but now it's also like, it's almost like, um, because it, it makes such a good whipping boy um, for media types, like people love to sort of 
make country music seem more conservative or, or more insular mm. than it actually is. Right. Um, but when, when you were talking about how there's been a sort of a backlash now towards the corporate style of music, you, you, you couldn't be more correct. When I started Saving Country Music in 2008, um, there was absolutely no outlet. There were some outlets for like Americana or folk music or things like that, um, like No Depression and such, but there really wasn't an outlet for country music that was the stuff that was not being played on the radio. Um, and so that's what I started advocating for. And, and really the reason there wasn't an outlet for that stuff is because there was no commercially viable business model that you could bring to covering that kind of music. These days, you have artists like Sturgill Simpson, like Tyler Childers, like Cody Jinks, like Whiskey Myers, um, that, uh, like Brandy Carlisle, that have now created the, these are big stars. These are artists that like can sell out theaters, small arenas, have, you know, certified gold and platinum records. And they've done this solely without the support of country music radio or big award shows or mainstream music. Mm -hmm. And now they've become so successful that they, you know, the mainstream is paying attention to them. You know, I mean, uh, Jason Isbell has been nominated for a CMA award, which years ago we would have never considered that. Sturgill Simpson was nominated for a all genre Grammy album of the year a couple of years ago, right beside Beyonce and Adele mm. and Justin Bieber and Drake. And it's like, you know, I mean, that was a guy like I, when I wrote about Sturgill Simpson, the, it was like 2012 or 2011, whenever it was like I was the first outlet to ever talk about that guy. Not to brag, but it was like back then he was just a no name from Kentucky. Now, all of a sudden, here he is on an international stage. And that's because as soon as consumers find out that they have better options out there in the marketplace, they make better choices. And, and now with streaming, now with YouTube, now with podcasts like yours, you know, people can find this information. They can find these artists and they're making better choices. And now the independent side of, of country music and in music in general is almost just as big as the mainstream side. Yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting. And I think that's, again, it's across art forms, even beyond music, we're seeing the same in um in the world of writing i know the same the same is true is that you don't need to have whatever the corporate world has decided is the right book for the moment to be the right book for you you can actually go find what is the right thing for you and most importantly they can that author or that writer or that musician can find you and that's the amazing thing of what's going on today and the same is true in in media and journalism as well which is um a bit of a separate conversation. But I, you know, one thing I want to ask you about is really about country itself, like, you know, to kind of peel away from the universal uh, aspects to all this and think about what is it about country? Because, you know, and there is something to it. I remember traveling in Nicaragua once I went to the East Coast, which is Caribbean. And I was expecting to get there and just be like, you know, inundated by reggae in a great way. And I was like, this is going to be awesome. I love reggae. I'm going to listen to reggae all day long. And everywhere I went, it was country music. These were um, really? Black Caribbeans um, wearing, you know, cowboy boots and the 10 gallon hat or however many gallons it is. <laughs> I'm not sure. But um, it, and it was country uh, just across the board. And you're you, it opened my eyes to something, which is that I had always thought of country as being very much a, hitched to a certain kind of cultural experience, which is the one you talked about, the stereotype, you know, the, the, the South and the pickup and the whatever else. And it made me realize that it's not that because those weren't those people. They were very different people. So what do you think it is about country specifically that has this enduring appeal where music has changed so much in the past however many years we want to measure but certainly the last 10 to 20 years and yet country has uh remained such an important force in american music what is it about it in my opinion it's about authenticity you know there is country everywhere when you think about country music 
in its traditional boundaries, it's the American South and the American West. But every, you know, you go anywhere and everywhere, there are small towns, there are people farming, there are people ranching, there are people growing their own food, um, there are people uh, having get togethers on back porches and listening to music. Um, there are people that love their family. They, they look up to their grandparents. Um, and there's something wholesome and like uh, grounding about that experience that you hear in country music. And, and mm -hmm. you know, as, as much as like sort of the commercial side of country music is definitely like uh, nostalgia to a fault or, or very um, gets very cliche upon those themes. Um, it's still very, it's comforting to people. And um, I definitely, uh, you know, just uh, you're making that point about Nicaragua. That's very interesting. And mm -hmm. I've never heard about that. But there's, I mean, there are country, I've written about country artists from Africa. I've written about country, uh, a country guy from Iran. There's, uh, you know, tons of country artists from Europe. There's a huge mm -hmm. country scene right now in Sweden. Um, and it, when I say country, I don't mean like, close approximations. I'm talking authentic country music. In fact, country music that's more authentic than a lot of the commercial country you found in the United States. Just mm. amazing artists who are inspired by the traditions of country music and want to express it and express it in, in what is authentic to them. Like, so when you talk about authenticity, it doesn't mean you had, you had to grow up on a farm and riding horses. It's what is authentic to you? What is, what you know, honesty, like you can hear that honesty come through in the music. You know, the old saying is country music is three chords and the truth. And that's really, that's what it is. You know, it's like, it's a very simple folk style of art form, um, you know, that, that doesn't take itself too seriously, but also that expresses itself um, authentically. And, you know, authenticity is obviously something that you can argue back and forth because most certainly in country music, you know, people, you know, they emphasize their accents or they put on the big 10 gallon hat when they really have no need to be wearing a big cowboy hat, you know, but that's, you know, so certainly that's, you know, what authenticity is is sort of a mutable um, <clears throat> idea. But, you know, a lot of the, like the independent artists, that are doing well these days are those kind of authentic people. There's an artist named Coulter Wall who actually grew up in Canada. And he, like, this guy is the real deal. Like he, he when he's not writing music or performing, he's out running cattle. That's what this guy does and, and mm. he does that. I mentioned Tyler Childers earlier and he, uh, a, a while back had a really good, um, I don't know what to call it, a speech. I think it was in an interview where he talked about how where so many people have moved to Nashville, he has, he has stayed home in Kentucky because he wants to interact with authentic country people and like use that, the verbiage and the pentameter that these authentic people use that he's connected with it so that he can then turn around and use that in his music. Um, yeah, that's amazing. That And it's, it's obviously something that's very important in the culture, uh, which is authenticity. You know, this is this search for authenticity because it feels like people have kind of lost their their sense of groundedness, their sense of uh, identity and belonging. And that feels like a way to connect to something that is real because country, I think probably in its best sense or manifestations, isn't really about, um, the veneer, you know, maybe in some senses it, it is, and it does do that, but it really feels like it's not about the bling. It's not about the cars. It's not about the, you know, dollar bills flying through the air in the music video or whatever else. It is about things that are much more connected to actual physical fundamental reality, such as land, such as, you know, the natural environment, the people who are around you, whoever they are, regardless of their social status or wealth or other, any other things, they are the people that are important because they are here. And that's really an interesting idea in the culture we live in today, where everything is so measured by how many followers you have, or how much money or how many 
bitcoins you have in your wallet or whatever else it might be. So that's really something that does differentiate the country, um, the country as an art form. Yeah, I mean, like compared to like hip hop, for example, or a lot of today's pop music or even like adult contemporary country music in its in its true form is like the last bastion where you still hear artists playing wood on wire you know or mm. wire on wood right. you know like they're impressing with their fingers on you know uh, on acoustic and electric instruments they're singing right. without auto tune or or some sort of voice enhancement it's like it's raw it's it's a authentic type of like folk art that um his uh you know sort of resisted the ones and zeros now i say that but if you turn on mainstream country radio you're going to hear what you know a lot of what is basically a a southern form of pop or hip-hop and right. that's why you know that's that's why there's sort of this cultural clash going on in country music right now because and again nothing against hip-hop or pop or anything like whatever kind of music people find appealing is that's awesome you know but that's not country music you know country music specifically is sort of that authentic um you know human played instrumentation and uh raw emotion put to song and so you know you like the biggest song right now in country and mainstream country music um is a song by walker hayes uh called i think it's called fancy like that's what it's called and you listen to that song it's a hip-hop song it's a it's a white southerner speaking in a very very hip-hop pentameter mm -hmm. uh you know which really is like a, a, a version of cultural appropriate you know appropriation and that's what the appeal of the song is like you'll have a lot of people go oh i never thought i liked country music till i heard this walker <laughs> hayes song and the reason is is because it's not a country song it's a hip-hop song you know there's another huge artist named sam hunt who is kind of one of the pioneers of this and um you know it's like it's electronic instrumentation it's uh you know uh 808 drum beats and it's all this kind of you know it's it's electronic music that has like these southern stereotypes put in the in the you know like maybe they mention trucks maybe they mention back roads maybe they mention horses and stuff sort of like little nas x like you know it's like he talks about wranglers and horses or whatever and then all of a sudden it's a country song well not necessarily there's is are there country elements there sure but there's sort of the stereotypical elements, not the authentic elements. And so, you know, that's where we have this, you know, the culture war divides country music straight down the middle. And, um, you know, that's part of like, like, again, there's nothing wrong with um, hip hop cadences. There's nothing wrong with electronic music. There's some mm -hmm. amazing stuff being made uh, by electronic music art. I mean, I'm like, I mean, when I was growing up, like I listened to, you know, Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails. I listened to NWA. Like I heard it all. Like the Beastie Boys. You know, like these were like really foundational, important artists that that had massive reverberations throughout culture, and and were very creative and, and innovative, and uh, you know that stuff should be celebrated as well. But you know, there's something to be said about, um, you know, keeping. You know the the raw expressions you know like th that's what's so cool about multiculturalism you know some people look at, at country music and they say well it needs to be integrated it needs to evolve and of course it needs to evolve and it certainly needs to make sure that it's being open to people of all backgrounds uh you know the, the you know black people come from the country too you know there's a lot of latin artists out there that are from the country i mean you talk about nicaragua go to Mexico, like, mm -hmm. like Mexican mm -hmm. culture right. is all like printed, printed shirts and cowboy hats. Tejano music is the, is the country music of, of Central America. Uh, you know, cumbia music is the country music of South America. So the, all of this stuff is important. We should be inclusive and we should be open-minded to it all. But at the same time, like we should be, we should make country music into hip hop music because then you lose that cultural diversity 
that makes uh, the tapestry of popular, popular music so interesting and so diverse, you know? So that's the sort of the battle that's going on mm -hmm. right now, you know, in country music. Yeah, it, you know, it's a bit like you have these, uh, these monstrosities that are bred in, in private zoos. We have a tiger and a lion breeding together and it's you don't need whatever that thing is that it that it produces you need tigers to be tigers and lions to be lions because that's what makes them beautiful is that they are the thing that they are supposed to be um in terms of the cultural divide in country it being musical in one sense and in another sense i feel like it's also political because you know, I remember, and this is probably much more a, an effect of the corporate influence in country, but when I was a kid and we were, America was going through the first Gulf War in the 90s, we were all made to stand outside. I lived in Las Vegas at the time as a kid. We were all made to stand outside, put our hand, hands on our hearts and sing this country song about God bless America, where at least I know I'm free. I'm sure you know the song. <laughs> and it was like this kind of, even at the time, I'm like, hmm, this, this feels odd. Like we do have our own Pledge of Allegiance. Why are we all singing this country music pop song that's on the radio um, in support of a, a war that, I mean, I didn't care one way or another. I didn't, I was, you know, nine years old or whatever. But you fast forward to the next war in Iraq, and we have one of the biggest, uh, biggest and most vocal opponents of the war were the Dixie Chicks, as, as far as I remember. So, you know, there's it, it, it fractures along these lines that are not completely expected because, again, you feel like the stereotype is this flag waving, just kind of like gung-ho, literally, uh, you know, cocking the, the, the shotgun. Um, but it's not necessarily that. There is a diversity of thought and opinion that runs throughout country and breaks in whichever direction it breaks. So, you know, that's something that I, I just noticed um, but I wanted to ask you about an, another sort of offshoot, if I'm right in calling it an offshoot of country, I'm not sure that I am, which is this new wave of folk rock, you know, people like the Lumineers, um, uh, Edward Sharp and the Magnetic, uh, I forget what the rest of the name Magnetic was. Zeros, yeah. The Magnetic Zeros. Um, and, and I forget the name of the band right now. You may know they have this amazing video where it's just the four of these guys playing this great rhythm in different locations. It cuts from like them standing in a water fountain to them standing in someone's like some warehouse to someone's bedroom. Um, I'll have to look it up if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, but it's part of the same kind of folk rock, some of it kind of blurring into country. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because it really does seem to now be a force in music and in the culture. Do you feel like that is connected to country? Is that an offshoot, an offspring of country music, or is this something that's a parallel or a different tradition? Um, yeah, so the, the band you're talking about is the Dead South. Oh, and right. Yes. I think they're from Canada originally. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it, like they are huge. That video you're talking about is a yeah. massive, massive video. Yeah. And so back like I want to say maybe 2013 or so, there was definitely a big roots music resurgence in popular music. And it was uh, mostly the Mumford and Sons was like the big right. pile driver of this. Right. And then the Luminaire, Le, excuse me, Lumineers came along uh, with Hey Ho. And, you mm -hmm. know, the I think that was they it was coined the what was it the millennial whoop or something like that <laughs> um, to sort of describe that that style of music and then so now this is what you would traditionally call um americana music mm. now americana is very similar to country music like they're they're basically um very close cousins mm -hmm. and america you know it's all still roots music, right? Like roots music would encompass country, like sort of what we would consider traditional country music, bluegrass, blues, and even more sort of regional music like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Zydeco music or, or Cajun music and, and things like that. Um, so all of that goes into American roots. Um, and Americana is more sort of the broad term for that and so country music kind of fits in there um, but americana is also considered less of a commercial you know a commercial realm for country music even though like mm -hmm. i said like in 
like Mumford and Sons were the biggest band in whatever year that was, 2012, right. 2013. And the Lumineers, like these are massive arena selling out artists. Right. Um, so, you know, Americana draws very deeply from country music traditions. Um, and, you know, bluegrass and folk music. So country music was bred out of like Appalachian folk music that originally came from uh, from uh, the British Isles. You know, mm. you had Celtic and, uh, and Scottish immigrants that moved to the United States and settled in like the Appalachian region and brought those that instrumentation and those sort of folk traditions. And and then it merged with blues uh so, so you know like black blues music from the deep south and so that's how you get country music so you have like mm. fiddle tunes and stuff like that and then you have sort of those those bluesy sort of hank williams influences right. that come from uh, uh the black traditions and then like you have the banjo that comes directly from africa right. so this all created a melting pot which is country music <clears throat> and, excuse me and when country music sort of branched off into like the super commercial and super poppy style of music especially in the 20 in the in the in the 2010s that's when you started to see a resurgence in more of this authentic root style music you saw it both in country music on the independent side with artists like Sturgill Simpson and later Tyler Childers and Cody Jenks and these kinds of guys. But you also saw that in the Americana realm with <clears throat> Mumford and Sons, Brandy Carlisle, the Lumineers and these kinds of artists. Um, so, you know, I think that um, I consider that stuff still country music in mm -hmm. some respects. Now Mumford and Sons has gotten really far into like rock and roll these days. <clears throat> I mean, I would consider them a straight up rock band at this point excuse me right but um but certainly when they started out in the deep you know the um uh oh i keep i keep forgetting that name the the dead south yeah the dead south are definitely they fit in that in that realm so you know yeah. I, I consider these guys you know i, I consider them country music um yeah. but there's qualifiers there right right Right. Yeah. I mean, the Dead South uh, is, is, you know, especially in the, that video, um, which people have to go check out, just go to the Dead South and check out their YouTube page and you'll see this incredibly done video in its simplicity and its spellbinding. And the music is amazing. Um, but they really kind of connect to people who are, are, are not as familiar with the sort of pure country music uh, tradition sure. it's like kind of a, a an entrance into that space into that field that is a, a little easier i think for people who are coming from rock or or a bit from folk but you know as you're saying these all reach back to the same traditions and i think to you know the, the, it's almost like there's a there's again another divide there which one is a kind of a musical divide there's the musicality that is coming from the different musical traditions of the British Isles, as you mentioned, uh, the, the banjo from Africa, that kind of melding into this really instrumental um, Appalachian country music, which like, you know, the the ultimate stereotype of which is the deliverance banjo riff, right. which which is actually amazing. I mean, when you look at it and when you watch that scene, it's, it's truly incredible. Um, and then there's the other side of it, which is the poetic, uh, as you mentioned, the poet laureates, of, of folk music, which is the tradition of Towns Van Zandt and the tradition of, um, you, know, we, you know, we both have a mutual acquaintance uh, who is an acquaintance of Daniel, of um, Towns with Daniel Antopolsky, who I know yes. personally, he's a, he is a poet, he's a musician, but when you meet him, it's a poetic nature, it's a poetic approach to the music, it's about the writing. You go to Daniel's uh, farm in France, and he's showing you this room just full of binders, binders, and binders, and binders, and binders of, of songs that are poems. And I think there's this kind, of, that kind of split in the music as well. And that that movie I'd mentioned, Inside Lou, Lou and Davis, which the Coen Brother movies, you're watching the struggles of a poet um, as much as a musician, which I think is also something really fascinating because there are very few contemporary art forms today in pop, in the popular culture, not pop culture, but in the popular culture that are so directly tied 
to poetry and a tradition of poetry. And that is certainly one of them. And you really hear it in the, the songs, in the lyrics. And I think that's something that is so special. I don't know if you if it's the same thing in what I would call quote unquote pure country music or more traditional country music. I mean, you know, that might be something you might intone on, but I think that is something very unique um, about the whole genre. Yeah, you're a hundred percent correct. I mean, a Towns Van Zandt, I'm gonna paraphrase him here, but he said something to the effect of that he was just a poet and the music was sort of this thing that was getting in the way, you know? Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned Daniel because there's a great photo, people should Google it or whatever, of it's Towns Van Zandt, I think he's got a fiddle in his hand, and then there's Guy Clark, and then there's Daniel. And I had been seeing that photo for years. And I was like, who is this guy? Like he's standing with these two titans of American songwriting. And like, even when I would see the photo in like a big, periodical they wouldn't say who daniel was and i was like who is this guy I, I nobody seems to know who he was and then you know um a guy who was making a documentary about him um reached out to me about it and I, finally i found out who he was and you're right it's like and that's what i kind of one of the things i try to do at saving country music is connect those dots because without that these you know these artists and their and their music or their poems or whatever it is they just get lost and it's so crazy to me that there's so much great stuff out there and you know it's not going to appeal to everybody but the, if if like you're me if you're like me and you're like looking at this photo and you're like who is this guy there should be a way to connect those dots and like find this music if if it's out there you know if 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 you hear what's on the radio or what have you um and you're you know you know that there's something better out there you know when I, when I was growing up like I would hear the music on the radio and I would hear these like glimmers of stuff like I, I I didn't even listen to much country radio when I was growing up I listened to classic rock but I'd hear bands like the Allman you know like every once in a while you hear an Allman Brothers song or maybe they would play the Grateful Dead or something like that and so I knew that there was a whole other world of music out there that i that I wasn't being exposed to, but that was probably really cool. I just needed to figure out where it was. You know, this was before the internet. So, I mean, you just kind of had to have that cool uncle or that uh, older brother or older sister. Um, you know, there's a there's another music film, um, Almost Famous. Um, mm, great movie. If you've ever seen it, you know, yeah. and it's like the old older sister is the is the one that turns on the the you know the main protagonist on to like cool music it's like mm -hmm. hey here are these records yeah. you know it's like that's what i try to do with saving country music i try to be like that cool uncle or cool older sister who's like turning people on to that the real stuff that's out there that otherwise you won't find you know right so what you know looking ahead what are you seeing happening what do you where do you think this is all going um, in terms of these sort of clashing forces of, of pop culture, cannibalizing country, a country reasserting itself. Where do you think that the trends lie? What, pe what should people keep it, be keeping their ears open to? Well, I definitely think that with the advent of the internet and streaming and podcasting and YouTube and all this stuff, I definitely think that the independent side of, of music is going to continue to gain market share. And I think it can only open up the music more, including mainstream music. You see uh, the mainstream of country and the mainstream of music in general, they're now having to pay more attention to more authentic artists and more sort of on the fringes type stuff because that's mm -hmm. what people are listening to more, you know? And um, so I think it's definitely headed there. And I, th I think that can only be positive. I mean, when I started saving country music, there was, you know, like, the roots of country music had been virtually abandoned in the mainstream. There was no support behind independent or very little support behind independent artists. Now we're seeing these artists, you know, again, like there's, they're selling out venues, they're, they're winning big awards, they're, they're selling lots of albums. So there's a lot of promise, I think, in the future. Uh, my fear is, though, is the sort of rabid, you know, the, the same, the same tools that are, are being used to um, by by independent artists to get their their information out there, social media, 
and YouTube and this, you know, new media sources that are not tied to big mainstream corporations is also one of the biggest challenges because I think right now, you know, I think social media, media uh, is making us all a little crazy. I think mm -hmm. that it's, you know, that the, the rabid polarization in, in culture in general is making, um, is, is causing a lot of friction that's bad for the overall health of culture of which music is a portion of. You know, one of the great things about music is that it can bring people together from disparate backgrounds. Even something is it, that's supposed to be so much like such a niche niche thing, like like country music. Like mm -hmm. everybody can enjoy country music, and everybody can enjoy hip hop music or or whatever kind of music it happens to be. It's one of the, it's it's one of these rare things in culture that's a big tent. And so, but what I'm afraid is is like as as media, as culture becomes significantly more polarized and political, it's, it's encroaching on music's ability to bring people together and to see a common struggle, to walk in someone else's shoes, to see life from a different perspective than their own. You know, like I think you can, you know, if you're a, a white guy from, uh, you know, from Texas like me, uh, you know, it may be hard to see the black experience in America, but you can hear that through hip hop and vice versa. You might be a, you know, black intellectual from New York City and just, you know, stereotype all white people from the South as being closed minded racists who listen to country music. But if you actually listen to good country music, you'll see that the struggles of poor people are like universal, you know, and that, that everybody, you know, is, is struggling with common problems and that we have this universal nature about all of us. And music to me is the way to bridge those, um, those cultural and, and even political divides. And it, it frustrates me that um, both music is being used as a wedge, whether that be the sort of jigganistic um, American, you know, like overly, overly boisterous American anthem that like takes all the subtlety out of, you know, the beauty of being an American, or that can be, you know, someone stereotyping country music as being all racist rednecks, mm -hmm. when there's a tremendous diversity within uh, country music listenership, like you said, in Nicaragua, like, yeah. or even you know, like you talk about um, Merle Haggard and what he talked about is in regards to workers' rights. Johnny Paycheck, you know, uh, had a big, you know, a big anthem, um, you know, about, uh, you know, uh, take this job and shove it, you know. So, I mean, like it, it talks, it takes, you know, country music and music in general takes from all these different diverse backgrounds. And it can be where we come together and like share in our experiences. And I just, uh, my fear is, is that's going away as we more and more use music as a cultural identity, as opposed to just a form of community entertainment. Yeah, it's a great point. And it's, it's one of these things that I, I have been thinking about a lot, which is um, something that Naval Ravikant, who is a an, an prominent investor and sort of a thinker in a number of spaces, he says, the more we cling, the more we emphasize identity, the, the less happy we are because we polarize ourselves, we polarize the environment around us. Um, we make it about either or. But I do see, you know, I, I think that the, the singer's name is the masked guitarist, if I'm right about that. He's got, wears these like frills on front of his face and you can't really see who he is. Um, and he's partnered with um, some very famous, it might've been Reba McIntyre, but I might be wrong about that. But in any case, he's got these great videos where in the videos, it's not the, it's not the country music scene that you're gonna expect to see in a music video. It's something much more that, that you would expect to see on Netflix in terms of the cast of characters there, 
Um, if there's some like gender bending and just stuff that you really wouldn't associate, but the music is very country sounding to me at least. And I think that's kind of where, what you're talking about, the, where you can maintain the musical tradition and still open it up to new influences, new aesthetics, new ideas. And, and the, the music itself can be okay with that. And I think that's what people, people get very afraid that if we open to something new, the identity that we've always had is just going to collapse because, you know, they're, they suspect that it's too brittle. But if something truly robust, like a tradition um, of, of country music, which is deep and it's rooted, that it, it is resilient and it can accept new things without being distorted and contorted. Um, so I think that that is probably where opportunity does lie for progress and also for the maintaining of a great tradition. It is maintained by opening it up and not by shutting it down. So yeah, that's important. Yeah, I think I think you're talking about Orville Peck. Is that's that right. Yes, that, that's right. Yes. yes, yeah. Yeah. So Orville Peck, he yeah, he wears these masks and he's yeah. you know, he's a, a open uh, an out gay guy in country music. And that's yeah that's right. so that is unusual, but but I will say like you know, one of the great things about country music, when I started saving country music, you know, I wanted one of the sort of goals that I had is I wanted to make sure that it was a, you know, it was an art form that was open and inclusive to everybody. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me, I mean, because you'll see the accusation that there's a lot of racism and sexism and homophobia in country music. And I would say that that is traditionally, that's probably true. But I think that those the it's it's gone away significantly in the last many years but you know one of the ways that that you know i try to open people's hearts to people that are different from them is through music so that right like now what, like when i started saving country music in 2008 i don't know that there was any outwardly you know gay people in country music now you there there are all kinds of artists and you can use music to open people's hearts to that. Like, let's say there's someone who's just, they're out there and they just, you know, they're just against alternative lifestyles, whatever they happen to be, right? But if you present someone with music and it just, ha you know, it, 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 including like traditional country music, like really authentic, straight up, like fiddle and steel guitar country music, and that artist happens to be part of the LGBT community, or they happen to be black, or they happen to be of Hispanic origins, you know, they're not even going to care. That, 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 that particular listener is not going to care. They're going to focus on, it's like, oh, wow, this is great country music. Right. And then all of a sudden, you've taken someone who may have been, um, uh, you know, less than open-minded about someone who was different from them and you've changed their heart or their mind just a little bit, or maybe even a lot, to where they're now open, more open-minded to people that don't look or act like them. And you can do that through music, unlike how you can do that through other mediums. I mean, you could scream at that same person that they're racist and sexist and get out of here, I hate you, and you know, you're whatever, and just pass judgment on them. And some people are, you know, irreconcilable. I mean, there's straight up racists out there that do need to get lost and mm -hmm. don't need to have a forum. Yep. But if there's people that are just because of whatever it is, their upbringing, their, you know, whatever it happens to be, are not as open minded as they should be about people who are different from them. I think that music and country music specifically can open those doors, whether that's Orville Peck. Um, you know, there's there, there's a, a there, there's so many artists in country music right now. I almost feel uh, we're trying to name them all off that are from that LGBT community. Uh, you know, uh, Brandy Clark and Sarah Shook and the Disarmers, and I mean, it just goes on and on. Melissa Carper. There's so many great ones, and and they're making authentic, true country music that can go into the hearts of of those hardened hearts and soften them through the medium of musical expression. And I think that's really important. I think I, and, you know, but I think when you focus too much on identity, when it's like, that's the only thing either you're talking about, or it's the only reason you're talking about this artist's music, it's like, hey, 
you know, the, the music comes second, secondary and their identity comes first, you're missing the point. You're missing an opportunity to soften those hearts. And, mm -hmm. and, and usually what that does is it hardens the hearts when it's like, hey, you need to listen to this person because they're who they are, you know, because of their identity. You're, you're just going to make people um, sort of uh, go back into their own corners and like harden their positions mm -hmm. instead of softening them. And that's what I find frustrating. Sorry. <laughs> that's what I find frustrating as, as a journalist. I think in, in music media right now, there's so much of an emphasis on identity and I respect it and I appreciate it. Um, but I think that they're missing, like, they're missing the forest for the trees. You know, there's uh, uh, so much of it is like signaling as opposed to like figuring out pragmatic ways to open people's minds through the medium of music. 100% agreed. I think that's an incredibly um, apt and insightful way to look at it and, and especially connecting it specifically to country music. Uh, I think that's really eye-opening. So on that note, um, where can people go to find more about you and what you're doing? Um, well, obviously the website, savingcountrymusic.com. I mean, it's, um, you know, that, that will sort of give you a, uh, an idea, you know, and I'm, I'm covering news. I do kind of think pieces on kind of the stuff we've talked about here and to try to, you know, write album reviews for uh, and, and features for artists that I think um, are worthy and not getting enough attention. And at the same time, you know, I try to talk about some of the mainstream stuff as well and, you know, hold feet to the fire or give credit where credit is due. Um, so, and I'm on Twitter. Um, you know, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, um, you know, any of those, those outlets and, and follow along. And um, yeah. Great. So I, I do encourage people to go check out the site. You will absolutely learn something and um, hit up Kyle on Twitter as well. And that what's the Twitter handle? Uh, it's under my name, which is Kyle Coronas. Last name is spelled C-O-R-O-N-E-O-S. But I believe if you put in Saving Country Music, like the little the little at is my personal name, but I keep mm -hmm. it Saving Country Music. So I think either way you'll find, you know, okay. just search for it and you'll find it. And I really appreciate you having me on, by the way. I, I you know, I, I had heard your name before uh, because of the roach, the book you wrote about the New York Times. I mean, speaking mm. about like, I think you mentioned at some point trying mm. to get information out. I heard it on yeah. a podcast. I can't even remember which oh, podcast funny. it was, but huh. um, someone was talking about your book. And, uh, and so when, uh, when you reached out, I was like, oh, wow, I was sort oh. of I'm really excited to hear from you because, um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's funny. This is, you know, how we're connecting without those, like you said, the traditional mainstream outlets and right. people are just finding the information that they're looking yeah. for. So I really yeah. appreciate you. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, and I do think that is the, in a, another important point, which is that, you know, people always ask me, how can we, how can we find news that's reliable? Um, and I think the answer there is, Go out and search. Go out and search for the stuff that you like. And I think the the corollary to that is that it, if you're really not finding it, go out and create it. Go out and, and do what you did yes. in, in 2008 and just take that first little step and get it by the URL, get the blog, figure out what it is you're really interesting in, interested in and, and do it and continue to do it. And after a while, it'll grow into something great as just as you've grown saving country music into something really great. So thank you so much, Kyle. Um, we will, I hope, be in touch and maybe even do a follow up sometime uh, round two. But in the meantime, thank you very much for joining us on the Burning Castle podcast and um, listen to a great song for us tonight. And I'll do the same. Thanks so much for having me. It's, it's been a huge pleasure. Thank you.